Hello and welcome to Generation AI, the podcast where we demystify artificial intelligence in the world of higher education. I'm your host, Artis Kadu, joined by my insightful co-host, JC Bonilla. JC, hello and welcome. How are you doing today? Hello, hello, Artis. Hello, hello, friends. Today, we are recording on a topic that it's relevant for all the audiences following Generation AI, so I'm excited. We're going to talk about LLMs and ranking LLMs. Artists, as a CEO, me as a data executive, we're often balancing the strategy, business models. And we wanted to have this conversation about generative AI and LLMs because the business models in which these LLMs, these generative AI will be packaged and released to the markets will be the drivers of who becomes the dominant winner of the LLM battle. Everyone is competing from Google to Microsoft, OpenAI, Amazon, and many other fantastic technology companies to become the de facto LLM of the world. I don't think we can say that OpenAI has made that. And we're going to be talking about the cycle of technology adoption and how market share 50% is basically what we're going to try to get to. So the conversation today is about the business models and what would take an LLM provider, aka a technology, to take us to the next level and dominate. Now, why do we care? LLMs, yeah, of course, we're a bunch of nerds, especially artists and I, we love talking about LLMs, but this is a gigantic economic ecosystem. It is projected that by 2029, The LLM world would move from 10.5 million about last year to 48 billion US dollars. That's a cumulative growth rate of about 21% per year. I mean, in other words, put your money today in LLMs and expect that it's going to give you a 21% return over the next five years or so. Yeah. Ridiculous. Insane. Yeah. So. How do you package that? The conversation, like, what do you do in the technology strategy? It's going to make that be the winner who never takes most of the pot, most of this money. Yeah, I believe that when you look at the infrastructure that we need to build in order to build our future technology on this, it's going to be not just about foundational models, but then also the use cases that are built on top of that. Right now, we are only at the foundational models, right? and we are talking about these frontier models, and the camps are being divided already, where we have things like Microsoft and OpenAI in one camp, we have the Google of the world, and then we have the open source camps. So we have a few of them, but these technologies take so much money to build these models, what we call frontier models, like GPT-4, hundreds of millions of dollars in just raw compute to actually run this for months and build these large models, and they're going to get larger and larger. And not every company can do it. So the ones that are, you know, sprinting to the front lines are constrained right now by the ability for them to get machines and to get compute because they realize they can essentially print money as they gain the market dominance. Hence, the overvaluation of companies like OpenAI, Anthropic, Perplexity AI, where they have raised hundreds of millions of dollars with the expectation that they are going to return a lot more in the future. So your numbers, everybody's looking at those numbers and they're saying this is a gold rush for those companies because once we have them, they cannot be caught up. And as we build infrastructure on top of them, it's going to be very hard to rip them out or or there's going to be winners and losers for sure. Yeah. And we want to have the conversation around a taxonomy of closed source versus open source. Correct. Artis, can you remind everyone what's the difference between an open source versus a closed source software system? And why do we care about doing this taxonomy? So closed source traditionally has been, you know, you package a piece of software and you don't show somebody how the software was built. You don't show them the code of the software. You only compile that and you give them the execution, just the output, just give them the usage and they use the software and that's closed source. Element is a closed source type of system, right? Yes, we're a closed source platform. Most of the SaaS companies are closed source 
in the before you go into open source, the business model in closed source, it's usually you charge for the software. So that's how you make the money, right? You charge for usage, exactly. All right. So open source, what's the deal here? So there is two models in open source. One of them is just purely open source. So the community works in the open and you have usually dozens or hundreds or even thousands of contributors. Think about the Linux platform, the largest open source project out there. In the large language model world, open source just means something a little bit different because as these models get created, the software that's running is actually what are called the weights of these models. So in the closed source environment, the weights of these models are closely held you know, inside the company, whereas open source, everybody can get access to them and they can run these models in any type of infrastructure that they want. They have the models and they can retrain them or fine tune them and, and do whatever they want after that. And on the open source camp, Meta, it's trying to lead that conversation. We have Mistral for Stability AI. They have their stable LM model available. Open source will commoditize and have a business model where dollars and cents come in from tuning that model because, you know, it's generic and it's basically the weights available to all. But if I want it to be made specifically for us, training, customization, that's usually how these organizations will make their money. I mean, when I think of higher education and open source, my head goes to you and the first software team that you manage at NYU, Drupal, remember? A content management system? Yeah, Drupal. Yeah. Most of our websites nowadays are run by Drupal or WordPress, both open source. And I would say 99% of the servers out there or the software that runs on the servers is run on Linux systems. So open source as well. Yep. So friends at schools, we guarantee you have open source infrastructure running behind the scenes, and it's not one, probably multiple manifestations of that. So our first point is that these two camps, closed source and open source, will come to us, and the business models are different. We think, and this is basically the hypothesis, that one of them is going to take over, and within that camp, there's going to be a winner for closed source versus open source. But then when we're thinking about it, I really love that you said, but JC, remember, the winner is not the one that has the best tech, right? The underlying technology is important, but the winner is the one that implements it the best. So say more about that before we jump into looking at these factors that mediate that best implementation. But what do you mean when you said, hey, it's not the underlying tech, it's the best implementation of it? If we take the analogy from open source operating systems, you have the Mac OS, which is closed source, but it has an amazing experience, right? It has an amazing experience because that's what Apple decided to do and provide that for the users. You have Linux, not so good of an experience. However, it's very reliable. It runs our servers. It runs 99% of them. So the experience there was not to interact directly with the end user but it was to be reliable for a particular use case to run 24 seven for years and years without being disrupted. Whereas the Mac, it was about interactivity and interface. So at the end of the day, what I meant was that the application that we're going to use on top of these models, the technology is gonna be commoditized, meaning it's gonna be just like cloud computing. A lot of companies are moving to a multi-cloud infrastructure where cloud is just commoditized. They don't use just AWS or Google or Microsoft Azure. They use two or three clouds at the same time and they can move their infrastructure. With LLMs, it's going to be the same exact thing where we use them as foundational technologies, but what we build on top of it is where the value comes in. What about regulation? If the dominant design, it's not only about technology or the experience, it's now the external factors. What else can we think about? What would push one of these over the edge that it's outside the technology sector? I'm literally seeing Sam Altman in the congressional hearings and everyone salivating just because of that, you know, magnifying glass that the political arm gave to him. Like what else comes to mind? Anything else? So... That is exactly right, that legislation always benefits the market leaders, right? Because they have the money to push for legislation and to do lobbying and so on and so forth. And then usually the open source is the counter to that. Like usually you don't have really small entrants coming into these foundational models. 
can I put you on the spot? You're really good at reacting this way and you can come and say, I don't know, but I want to drive a parallel of technology adoption and kind of legislation with the common app, right? Please tell me if I'm wrong. It's not like the most sophisticated application or system out there, right? Element and many other systems do it 10 times better, but it dominates because selection of schools and states decided this is how we are going to render. What is the analogy of that on AI? I mean, I don't know. Can we see a state saying, I will allow all my data from the government to be mined by Google, but not Amazon, right? Or think about schools. There were some schools that actually banned TikTok on campus, right? So that's also, you know, legislation and decision making, right? Any applications you can think for AI? I mean, we talk about the sources of information, the data. These models are now trained on the public data. So there is a huge, huge set of private data that is being held by private companies, publishing companies, and those models that are able to access that information the fastest are going to gain an advantage on it. One of the research papers that came out maybe a couple of days ago, everybody made a huge deal out of training your own large language model on internal data. Bloomberg GPT was a thing about six months ago, and they came out and said, we are training this large language model on our own data. Well, guess what? Last week, papers came out that said Chad GPT or GPT-4 is able to beat Bloomberg GPT on all of its financial capabilities. So now we're seeing it's like, well, why would I do my own thing with all my own data? I can just use one of these frontier models. They're really, really good. So it doesn't really make sense for us to build our own. So those who are gaining access to this private data maybe might have an edge on it. But other than that, I don't know. I mean, I have to think about it a little bit more. I don't know. What, what do you think? Man, we're converging that it's going to be on training, right? And literally what I'm thinking about when I was close to the ecosystem of data and cities, how political it was. I sat on for about three years on the Center of Urban Science and Progress, and we're trying to understand how to use city services and data. And it was so difficult to get the sanitation data and get parks and recreation to share data, right? And all of a sudden, it just happened because someone said, you can have it. So having said that, I could totally see Michigan saying, we will not play with Google for whatever reasons, right? And then also like the Michigan data, it's removed or the LLM basically has guardrails in Michigan, right? Type of things. Second part, and this is where the closed source conversation is important. There's many campuses that are Microsoft versus Google. I think those are the two dominant technologies, right? So I don't know why you were a Google campus, emails, you know, all the kind of things. So it'll be crazy if they go with the Microsoft OpenAI solution, right? Because it just fits better to bring in the Google Cloud services in that ecosystem. So is this idea of technology compatibility or the perception of interoperability, that's really where my head is going. So we'll see, we'll see. Yeah, there's always gonna be the perception of security and safety in a closed source environment. And we see that every single day where somebody doesn't pick element because they feel, oh, you guys have only been around for six years. I'm gonna go with someone who's been around for 20 years because they're probably gonna be here a little bit longer. Meanwhile, that is absolutely, you know, the wrong way to think about it from a business value. However, there's still that notion in your head that longevity goes together with security and larger markets share, it's better. So we're seeing a lot of those early adopters come in and 2024 will certainly be in favor of the early adopters still, because last year it was the year of experimentation. This year will probably be early adopters and maybe 2025 will be when we're going to see perhaps the early majority kind of jump in. Very good segue on to what we're going to do next. So to recap the conversation, there is this divide of open source and closed source and the business models ought to be different, right? Because you make money selling software or you make money customizing the software that is free. Then what we also discussed is this idea that to evolve in technology adoption and win market share, there's all these factors. The underlying technology has to be great, but how it gets orchestrated against the compute, the experience, the UI, the UX, customer success, and of gigantic amount of possibilities, 
that are outside the non-technical domain from policy, from legislation, perception, or I don't know, drama that we maybe saw when a CEO gets fired, right? All those externalities are critical. So what we want to do now, it's bring them into a framework of what we call the battle or the mapping, right? And art is as reference to early market or, you know, early adopters. And it, this is all nicely explained in a framework that's called the technology adoption curve. Artis, do you remember the technology adoption curve from your MBA days? Yeah. Well, a lot of people reference that today, of course, for sure. Of course, it comes from the 60s. And to give everyone a quick, quick tour on how this evolves, because it is the way in how technology strategy and market share, in a way, it's discussed in boardrooms, which is the jump from early adopters to early majority. So what does that mean? There's groups. The first group is only 3%. It's called the enthusiast. That's you and me, artists. ChatGPT launches, and we were using it on day one. We'll try anything. <laughs> I know. We're so easy, guys. But th that's who we are, right? We're called innovators. Love that. And then there's a 12.5%, about 15% now, that is called the early adopters. So this is just basically where we are today. This is about 15% of the market share. Today, generative AI and LLMs is in that chasm what happens after the chasm is that you go mainstream, and that's called the early majority. That's when you reach your first 50 percentile. That means that half of the market share is differentiated. Some of them are going to go here, some of them are going to go there. But then, in terms of innovation, and this is where a CEO like artist is challenged to like produce cutting-edge new technology to reach a 50 percent, and what research says is after that is what is called cyclical or incremental innovation. You don't have to come up with bolt which is, you know, how Element introduces AI. Those are big innovations. It just becomes incremental. In other words, think about Microsoft, think about Apple, iPhone, how these launches and new products feel like, yeah, they just made the camera better. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So this is where we're at today. Significant innovation needs to be pushed and the alignment of cloud, UX, experience, implementation that works needs to happen to reach that 50%, okay? Artists, did I do justice to the technology adoption curve? Spot on. I think we'll make our professors proud. So where do we see the open source versus the closed system? Those camps try and identify one of them and what do they need to do to get there? So let's start with closed source. Who do you think gets to early majority? Who goes over the chasm and why? We have ChatGPTs, you know, from OpenAI, we have Bard, we have Claude, Ernie from Baidu doing the best Mandarin LLM outputs. Who do you think is the first one to get mainstream and why? Well, I mean, the OpenAI models were certainly the ones to get mainstream. And the reason for that was because they built a product on top of it. ChatGPT was the product that featured this technology. And that's exactly what we're talking about. It's going to be all about what we build on top of this. So interesting. We talk about the adoption of ChatGPT as the product. 100 million users in less than, you know, a, a month or so. So this is this incredible adoption and it's all a product. But artists, we're battling here, everybody. So buckle up. Meta reaches 100 million users in like a week or two weeks. I forgot, but it's basically almost half of what OpenAI does. Why? And I'm not saying Meta is going to win, obviously, because they are in the open source. Why? Because when they launch Threads, it's already part of a, an ecosystem of users, Instagram, and it was like literally a button and you were already in threads. What does that mean? Google. Google will win this year. And I think this is the year of Google because of my earlier point, right? There's already a 50% market share on multiple things, cloud services, right? So if they play it right, Gemini and their bards and all those type of things that they're doing, should gain so much market share in my, I guess, prediction, if I were to call this prediction, is that they're actually get there faster than OpenAI. And Microsoft. So we have to put OpenAI and Microsoft together, by the way. I think they're using the same foundational model. So let's group those together. So I find that, you know, it's the same LLM probably behind the scenes, but they prototype it differently. 
I really think that OpenAI and Microsoft are not collaborating on product market fit. Right. Right. And in a way they compete, although the underlying technology may be the same. Whereas Google, I think it's going to win because of how they are already embedded and they're trying to bring it together. That's a very fair point. You can see some of the supporting argument around that because even though Bing has had the same model, the usage of Bing has slightly increased over the last six months or so since they've introduced it. So essentially, Microsoft is conceding that introducing AI is not helping the Bing brand. Uh, hence, they moved on to what they're calling it Copilot now. So they moved away from the Bing. And again, this is why it's the early adopters. It's really hard changing people's minds. Yes. So everybody loves Google. Everybody loves Google. There's a perception of what Google does. Of course, Microsoft is standard for many gigantic organizations. So we'll see how they play that out. And I see OpenAI just thriving on a small business or individual users. But when it comes to the institutional users, enterprise licensing, if you will, my money is on Google, my friend. So... If we agreed to disagree. Art is putting his winning on Battle of LLMs for OpenAI and me putting it on the Google fam. Let's do uh, open source. My hunch is that we're going to converge here. Who do you think gets to early majority, reaches 50% using an open source business model? You need a lot of support behind open source and those companies that have a business model where they're already established. They're using this project for some of their underlying technology, but they're not dependent on it. Hence, Meta and Llama, the Llama ecosystem. Meta is producing amazing research right now, and they're producing a lot of a lot of work. Well, actually, I'm I'm kind of rooting for Meta, given the deep pockets that they have and the deep resources, and the mindset because you want to use it <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And the mindset that these models should be open and contributing to the larger ecosystem and the larger society. I'm rooting for Meta in here. Similar. I think that if they play it right, open source Llama will become a dominant player. And then many smaller players will benefit significantly from their advancement. We'll see how it plays out. And also my assumption is that they're powering these AI searches in WhatsApp and multiple like that using Llama. So we'll see. All right. Well, there you have it. So battle of the LLMs, we did not converge on the closed source systems camp open AI with their GPT strategy versus what I think will be the year of Google. And then for open source systems, look out for what Meta and Llama are doing on LLMs. Artists, that's all we have for today. But what do you think, man? I love the technology adoption curve. I think we don't always look back at some of these tools and techniques and, and frameworks that we learn. We go back to them and like, man, now I understand or now I get it as, as I'm building these things myself rather than this abstract research that goes on and, and how you're mapping markets. So I really enjoyed that. I feel really, really excited for the year ahead and that for our audience. Some of our audience might be saying, oh, man, I, I, I don't really understand, or maybe I do understand, but like, how does this apply to me and higher education and the work that I'm doing? And we are trying to bring a lot of that technology vernacular, what's happening, how you think about it, trying to demystify it and trying to bring it down to a very clear, concise terms. And if you have any feedback for us around that, and if you'd like to understand more about a specific topic or another, I would welcome your feedback, artists at element451.com. If you just email me and say, hey, I love the podcast. However, we need more explanation on certain things. We can geek out quite a bit. JC and I can keep doing this, but we're going to try to find topics that are relevant, that are not basic but are meaningful and can bring our deep knowledge of this technology and systems to the everyday user and to the enthusiast as well, right? Because there's a lot of listeners that are enthusiasts of technology. They might be building technology themselves in campuses, in IT departments, and so on and so forth. A hundred percent. Well, there you have it. Please let us know what you like in about this series. Let us know what you think you'd like to hear more about and help us reach the chasm. Everybody, thank you so much. Have a wonderful week and we'll see you in the next episode. Take care, everyone. Till next time.